with Gerald McKeegan at the Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland, California. He'll start with some historical observations about the equipment and he'll move on to some of his research. Hi, I'm Gerald McKeegan. This is our oldest telescope. This is the original Oakland Observatory Telescope. It was built in 1883 by Alvin Clark and Sons. Uh, the telescope was donated to the Oakland Observatory by Anthony Chabot, who was a uh, engineer and hydrologist in the Bay Area at that time. He uh, was the head of the uh, Contra Costa Water District, and he donated $3,000 to build this telescope and the observatory. The original location of the observatory was in downtown Oakland uh, in Lafayette Park and it was opened in 1883 right across the street from the high school. Um, the telescope originally belonged to the o Oakland Board of Education and they operated the telescope for students at the high school but one of the stipulations that Anthony Chabot made was that the telescope would always be available for public viewing for free. So from 1883 until today, we still operate this telescope for free public viewing. Now, at the time he made the donation, he stipulated that the telescope and the observatory would not be named after him. But when Anthony Chabot died, they changed the name to the Chabot Observatory and eventually it evolved to become now the Chabot Space and Science Center. So I'll just tell you a little bit about this telescope. This is an eight inch refracting telescope. That means it's a long tube with a lens at one end and an eyepiece at the other end. That lens is eight inches in diameter. Uh, it's on an equatorial mount, which means that the telescope can track as we're observing. It can track uh, the motion of the stars caused by the rotation of the earth. Uh, it has a, a drive system here that uh, it, today it's an electrical drive system. In the original um, uh, telescope, it was a mechanical drive like on a grandfather clock with a weight and a chain and you pull the chain and the weight as it slowly descends, it would drive the, the system. Today we have an electric motor on here and what that does is turn the telescope in the opposite direction that the Earth rotates but at the same rate of speed as the Earth rotates. And by doing that, you keep the object you're looking at centered and you're compensating for the rotation of the Earth. Um, you'll notice on the top of the telescope there's a short um, tube up there. That's actually a camera. Uh, that camera was installed several years after the original telescope was built. It uses glass plates. You'll look on the back end, you can see that there's a uh, frame for the glass plates to be mounted. You point the telescope at um, an object that you wanted to photograph and then if you look carefully up there you'll see that the front end of the uh, camera opens up so it's like a shutter and that opens and then you take a long exposure um, and then close it and then go develop the glass plate and that was used back in the 1920s 1930s for astrophotography with this telescope telescope can be moved and pointed in any direction. We can move it like this and we can also move like this. So we call, call this motion declination and we call this motion right ascension. And by move, moving in combinations of those two we can point the telescope at any object we want to look at in the sky. The dome rotates, so we just turn the dome and point it in the direction that we want to look and open the shutters and start observing. So you'll see some numbered dials on here. This is the declination dial that shows the angle that we're looking at in declination. Declination is measured north or south of the, equ of the equator. Uh, so, uh, for example, we might look at an object that's 20 degrees north of the equator, so we would dial that in there. Right ascension is a little more complicated with this telescope. We use what's called an hour angle. An hour angle is the angle between the object we want to look at 
and the meridian. The meridian is a line between uh, that goes from the South Pole through the zenith to the North Pole. And the object that we want to look at is some angle from that line. And so that's what we measure here with this scale. Um, the tracking system can only run for about two hours. So after about two hours, we have to stop the telescope, reset the tracking system, and then reacquire the object and then start tracking again. So um, this is again our, our oldest telescope. It was built in 1883. Um, we give all of our telescopes names. This one we call Leia. So what we're going to do now is transition and we're going to go over and look at our second oldest telescope and that's our 20 inch telescope. So these are just photographs showing the second Chabot Observatory site. Uh, this was in the Leona Heights part of the city of Oakland. Uh, in fact, it was located right at the end of what was in the streetcar trolley system. Um, and you see the building here. You'll notice that the building has two domes. The smaller dome housed the original 8-inch telescope, uh, Leia, and then the bigger dome was for the new telescope, Rachel. Uh, so this is the 8-inch dome, this is the 20-inch dome. Uh, at that time, it was a very nice location. Like I say, it was right at the end of the trolley line, so it was easy for people to get to. Um, and there was no, not a lot of lights or anything around it, so it was a really nice, dark location. Um, that location, however, over time became, had more and more light pollution, uh, a lot of trees started growing up, and it turned out it was also located on the Hayward Fault. So that became a problem. Uh, once they realized it was on the F Hayward Fault, there were concerns about it not being earthquake safe. Um, and so the school district actually uh, closed it for a while. Uh, then they reopened it for only uh, public viewing and no longer brought school groups here. And they started looking for a new site. And they moved to the new site in the year 2000. The original Chabot Observatory was built in 1883 in what is now downtown Oakland. Um, as the city grew, they started installing electric street lights and house lights and so forth. And pretty soon light pollution became a problem for the observatory. So in the early 1900s, they began looking for uh, a new site. At that time, the director was Charles Burkhalter and he led the effort to try to find a new site. Eventually they found one uh, in the lower part of the Oakland Hills near what is now the intersection of Interstate 580 and Highway 13. Uh, so in the early 1900s, they uh, actually, I think it was around uh, 1915, they moved into that site. And at that time, they also acquired a new telescope. Uh, so they contracted with Warner and Swayze and company to build the telescope tube and the mount, and with John Brashear to build the, uh, or to make the optics for the telescope. So together they worked on the telescope and eventually built what is now our 20, 20 inch uh, refracting telescope. Um, this is a refractor telescope, so it's a long tube, it's 31 feet long. Uh, at the front end of the tube up here, you see where the 20-inch uh, uh, lens is, and then it's just a long hollow tube to the back end of the telescope where the eyepiece is. Uh, it is you can see that the mount is much larger than the uh, mount for the 8-inch telescope, and that's because the longer the telescope is, the bigger the mount has to be. Uh, this is also an equatorial mount, so I'm going to show you here in a second how the drive system worked. This is also a, an equatorial mount, so it tracks the object we are viewing, compensating for the Earth's rotation. Now today, we have an electric drive on the telescope that does that. But in the early days, it had a mechanical drive. So there was a weight on a chain, you pull the chain, raise the weight, as the weight descended, it turned the drive system. So in here you see what was then the speed governor for the mechanical drive system. 
uh, the drive system had to turn the telescope at the same rate as the Earth's rotation, the same angular rate as the Earth's rotation. So this speed governor assured that that would happen with the uh, mechanical drive system. This telescope has been in use for public observing since the year 1916. Although it was built in 1915, uh, it did not immediately go to the Chabot Observatory. In 1915, there was the Panama Pacific Exhibition in San Francisco, and Warner and Swayze Company wanted to display the telescope at the exhibition. So for the majority of the year 1915, the telescope was in San Francisco at the Panama Pacific Exhibition. At the end of 1915, uh, they brought it across the bay to the new Chabot Observatory site and installed it, and calibrated it, and then they started public viewing through the telescope in March of 1916. Again, this is a 20-inch refractor. It's very similar in design to the 8-inch refractor, Leia. Uh, this one is called Rachel. And if you look up here, you can see the declination axis, that numbered axis right there, and then the right ascension axis is over here. Uh, like Leia, you move the telescope around those two axes to point the telescope at the object you want to view. Once we're uh, on the object, we rotate the dome to align the opening of the dome with the telescope and the direction that we're trying to view. Okay, I think now what we'll do is head on over to look at our newest telescope, the 36-inch reflecting telescope. So astronomers are always looking for more light in their telescopes. Uh, the size of a telescope, the length of the telescope is not the thing that's important, it's the diameter of the telescope. The wider the telescope is, the more light it gathers, the fainter the object it can see, the farther it can see, and the more detail it can see. So we're always trying to get telescopes that are wider and wider. So in the year 2003, uh, Chabot, a, an engineer here at Chabot, designed a new telescope, and this is the telescope that you see behind us. It's a 36-inch reflecting telescope. And by reflecting, I mean it uses mirrors instead of lenses. So inside the telescope, there are two mirrors. There's a big mirror at the base of the telescope, and then there's a small mirror at the front end of the telescope. Light comes in, hits the big mirror. The big mirror has a curved surface. So when the light hits it, it bounces off as a cone of light. That cone of light hits the small mirror at the front of the telescope, bounces off of it, back down to where the eyepiece is. So the path of light inside the telescope is, uh, is not a straight path, it's folded. And that makes the telescope very short, but because of the wide diameter, this is our most powerful telescope. Uh, this is also our only computer-controlled telescope. Uh, unlike the other telescopes where you saw a lot of handles on it and we moved them around by hand, with this telescope we just go to the computer, tell the computer where we want to look, and it does all the work for us. Now, we're in a little bit different type of an observatory here. We're not in a dome. We're in what's called a rollback roof observatory. The roof is on rails on either side of the building, and there's a frame behind the building. And when we want to observe, we roll the roof all the way back. It sits on that frame behind the building, and we're completely exposed to the sky here. So this telescope, is also open for public viewing every Friday and Saturday night, but we also use this telescope for research. So we have a couple of projects that we do here. One is astrophotography with this telescope, but the other one is searching for and tracking near-Earth asteroids. For the uh, asteroid tracking program, uh, this telescope, which we call NELI, is part of a global network of observatories that searches for and tracks near-Earth asteroids. Um, to do that, we point the telescope at a part of the sky where we think there may be an asteroid, and then we just take multiple pictures of the same part of the sky over a period of, say, half an hour. And what we're looking for is a star that moves. The word asteroid actually means star-like, and when we see asteroids in the telescopes, they look very much like stars, except that unlike the stars, they move, 
and that's how we identify them. So you see an example here. This was a real easy one to uh, track. Uh, this is the asteroid Phaethon, which is part of the, uh, which is the source of the uh, Geminid meteor shower in December. Um, and you can see it across here. This is a set of images that we took over a period of about 40 minutes, and you can see the asteroid moving. And this is how we we find them: is we just look for a star that's moving. Once we find them, then we get some data for, from the uh, images. We identify the exact position in each image, uh, the exact time that the image was taken, down to a fraction of a second, and uh, also the brightness of the asteroid. That information is put together in a specially formatted email, which is sent to the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center, which is in Massachusetts. And the Minor Planet Center receives these emails uh, with a computer. And then our data and data from other observatories is combined to calculate the orbits of these asteroids, determine whether or not they are a threat to the Earth. Uh, Minor Planet Center then gives a designation to the asteroid and catalogs it. And then once we've found it and identified it, uh, we have to keep tracking it. Uh, the, usually when the asteroid is first discovered, it's only observed for a couple of days, so your observations cover a very short section of its total orbit. And so you have to keep observing it to better characterize the, the orbit of the asteroid. So we do that, that's called follow-up, and we will do that if, if there are no asteroids for us to try to confirm new asteroids, and we'll go to existing asteroids and do follow-up observations in order to improve the orbit calculation. Okay, so these images that you see here, this, we, we chose this because it's a nice, easy one to see. The asteroid is nice and bright, easy to, do, to detect, but actually most of the time when we do this, it's not so easy to see the asteroids. Um, so I'm just going to show you a more realistic uh, set of images here. Uh, this is the actual software that we use to, to analyze it. And this is a set of images that's more realistic for what we see when we're uh, trying to search for asteroids. And when you look at it, you don't see an asteroid very well. But if you look very carefully right here, you see that little faint dot moving. That is the asteroid that we were trying to track. This is much more typical of how it is to try to track asteroids. We don't see a nice bright star. We see a very faint one. And sometimes they're hard to spot. And then, of course, once we, we do spot it, then we use the software to get data from it. Uh, we can uh, click on it and uh, get some data here, the, the exact position, the exact time, how bright it was. That information is then submitted to the Minor Planet Center and then they combine it with data from other observatories to calculate the orbits. So this is Conrad Jung. Conrad is uh, our staff astronomer here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. And Conrad uses this telescope, in fact he uses all three of our telescopes, to do astrophotography. So Conrad's going to kind of demonstrate to you uh, the, the equipment he uses and how he sets up to do astrophotography. So take it away, Conrad. Right. Well, thank you, Gerald. Um, in, in doing astrophotography with the telescope, uh, one of the things that we're going to be uh, needing to do here with this telescope is to turn it from a, a device that uh, we can look through the telescope into uh, device that we can take pictures with. So uh, what Gerald's going to do now is remove the adapter and the accessory necessary for us to actually um, uh, look through the telescope and then we're going to attach a, a simple adapter to the telescope. Okay. That will allow me now to attach my camera and as I attach my camera I'll just show the camera off to you real quick. It's, uh, it's nothing fancy. It's a regular digital SLR. Uh, pretty much what you might find if you go on eBay or go to a camera place to get a camera. Uh, there is a, and if you were to look at all the controls, the functions and the appearance of the camera, it looks like a regular camera in, in, in all operational 
functions, it is a regular camera except for one little difference. Inside, uh, over the digital sensor, there's normally a, a filter which allows normal regular photography. That uh, filter uh, controls the uh, infrared uh, light to the, to the sensor and in normal, in normal uh, snapshot photography that can affect color, uh, color uh, balance. Um, that filter unfortunately affects astronomical photography so uh, in this particular camera we've changed out that filter for a filter that allows transmission of light not into uh, to the infrared but into the deep red and uh, because uh, certain astronomical objects do give off light in the deep red and uh, we want to preserve that ability to capture that red light. So with that in place, uh, all the other functions of the camera are essentially the same. We're now going to install the camera onto the telescope and you'll notice one of the things that I've, uh, oops, excuse me, one of the things that i am also, um, you'll see is I don't have the camera lens itself on the telescope, uh, excuse me, on the camera and that's because we're going to be using the telescope as the camera lens. So we'll install that in and we'll secure the camera. Like so. Now, uh, in modern astrophotography, we don't take a single picture. Uh, we take usually a series of pictures, uh, uh, and the exposure might be a fraction of a second if we're shooting something very bright, like say the surface of the moon, um, or it could range out to several minutes um, if we're shooting something like a faint faraway galaxy or nebula. Um, in almost all those cases, we'll use, I'll use a simple remote control that you see here. Um, I know some people are fond of wireless controls, but I, I like wired simply because it's, it's more secure uh, and, at least for my purposes, uh, easier for me to use. The controller has a number of different functions that are built into it. I could use it to just trigger the, the camera. Whoops, let's see if we can just turn this on for a moment. I can just demonstrate that. Um, I can just push a button and trigger the camera, or I can program the controller to trigger the, the camera automatically. Now for most of my photography, I set it in the automatic function, and I let the controller trigger the camera on a regular interval. Uh, for my deep sky photography, I typically use maybe a one to two minute exposure. Now that sounds very, very short, but it isn't a single exposure. I take a long series. It may cover uh, several hours. Uh, taking a series of one to two minute exposures. Then once that whole series of photographs has been completed, uh, the camera is removed. The pictures are installed into a computer and then the, all the images will then be combined and then processed in the computer. When you say you take images over several hours, is that over just one night or can it be over several nights? Um, it can be over several nights. Uh, it is not unusual for a lot of my deep sky photography to cover uh, up to a week. Um, and uh, on some of my exposure, so my total exposure time may be, uh, my longest exposures are probably in excess of five hours. And, uh, and then again, and again, these are done in increments of one to two minute exposures. And do you use all the images do you take or do you end up rejecting some of them? Um, it depends. If we're doing deep sky photography, uh, light is a little hard to come by <laughs> around here sometimes, and so I may try to the best of, uh, of the quality of the pictures to use as many as I can. Uh, if I can't use them all, I will use them all. In other kinds of photography, scene conditions will affect the quality of the image, so I may pick the very best pictures and use those pictures to make the final image. And when you process those images, how much work is involved in processing the images? Oh, <laughs> um, there's quite a bit of work. Um, it turns out that taking the pictures of the astronomical objects is part, is only part of the work that's done. 
Uh, it turns out there's a number of other pictures and they are called calibration images and sometimes they're nothing more than just taking the picture of the inside of the shutter. All of these pictures uh, are then added together with the actual picture to create a working image from which final processing can occur. So we can, um, I may begin one night and I may not finish for another night or two <laughs> to get a final image for, uh, for a particular object. Now, we've seen a number of your images around the Chabot Space and Science Center, but I understand that they were also exhibited at the Smithsonian Institution. Yes, I was uh, selected as one of the uh, astrophotographers for a special exhibit put on by uh, put on by the National Air and Space Museum, and uh, uh, for uh, about six to eight months, my pictures were on exhibit actually in a small gallery space, not too far away from the backup mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, those pictures were my own pictures; they were taken with my own telescope. Uh, so they were not pictures that I uh, took from here at Chabot, but from my own equipment at my at, a, at my own location okay. for star for astrophotography. So not only are you up here taking astrophotography with Chabot's telescope, but you also use your own telescope to do that. Uh, yes, I okay. I guess my 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 work is my hobby, and my hobby is my work. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is our Meridian Transit Telescope. The meridian is an imaginary line that goes from the south pole of the Earth through the zenith, the point directly overhead, to the north pole. And it's a line that exactly divides the sky in half. And astronomers learned a long time ago that by keeping track of when certain objects cross the meridian, uh, they can tell the time of the day and the time of the year. Before there were electric clocks or atomic clocks or cesium clocks and so forth, the only way you could uh, accurately tell the time of the day and keep your clocks uh, uh, correctly calibrated is to use a meridian transit telescope. And so what would happen is observers would use a meridian telescope, they would point it at the meridian, in fact it's actually mounted so it can't point anywhere else except towards the meridian, and then they would uh, record the exact time certain celestial objects would cross the meridian and then they could use that to calibrate the clocks and uh, this was how it was done 120 years ago when the uh, when they did this they would send a signal to the local fire station and then they would ring a bell at noontime each day based on the uh, signal that they got from the Chabot Observatory and that was how all the local people kept their clocks calibrated. So uh, in the late part of the 20th century, uh, they realized that the site on the lower part of the Oakland Hills was right on top of the Hayward earthquake fault. And that became a problem. They could no longer uh, bring school children to the, to the facility. So they began looking for a new facility and eventually they located a site here up on Redwood Ridge in the middle of the Redwood Regional Park um, and we moved to this location in the year uh, 2000. Uh, this is a much larger facility than the previous one, uh, cost 70 million dollars to build this facility and uh, as you wander around if you come up to the Chabot Space and Science Center you'll see we've got two large buildings plus the observatories and there's quite a bit of activity going on here. Um, in the early part of the t 21st century, we had a director named Alex Barnett, and she had a lot of contacts with the Russian space program. And with her assistance, we were able to acquire quite a few Russian space artifacts. Uh, space capsules like what you see here. This is the Soyuz space capsule that was used in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, we also got several uh, Russian space suits and some other Russian artifacts. Uh, in fact, we even have a Russian space toilet here. So uh, uh, if you look over here, you see that these are models of the Soyuz rocket that would launch the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, this is the configuration that it was in uh, while it was on orbit. 
and the section right here in the middle, that's where the cos cosmonauts were. And that is the part that descended and came back to Earth uh, at the end of each mission. So uh, I think we're going to go up and take a look inside the Soyuz capsule so you can see how uh, roomy it is inside. <laughs> Okay, well you're looking at the interior of the space capsule and you see uh, with the cosmonauts, there were three cosmonauts in the space capsule and they were very close together. Uh, it was pretty crowded inside. Uh, you see the cosmonauts are wearing what's called the so-called uh, spacesuits. This was the spacesuit they wore during launch and when they came back to Earth. It's a pressurized suit. Uh, suitable for wear inside the capsule. So if they were to lose pressure inside the capsule, uh, these spacesuits would protect them. But these spacesuits are not uh, EVA suits, extra, extra vehicular activity suits. Uh, so they couldn't go do spacewalks with them. This, these were only used for during launch and landing inside the space capsule. So this is the uh, Soyuz capsule. This is actually the descent module. It, when it was in orbit, it was attached to two other uh, modules. But when the cosmonauts got ready to return to Earth, uh, they would jettison those other two modules, and it was just this part that came back to Earth. Now, the back end of the Soyuz capsule is a heat shield. And as the capsule came back to Earth, it came uh, down through the atmosphere back in first because during re-entry you build up a heck of a lot of uh, heat and uh, you had to have some way of protecting the, the cosmonauts so this heat shield was designed to withstand very high temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees and it would slowly ablate away which means it would slowly burn away it had material on it that was designed to do that uh, and for the few minutes that they came down through the atmosphere, uh, this would, the heat shield would protect the uh, cosmonauts. Once they got down into the thicker part of the atmosphere where they weren't uh, going through that heating process anymore, uh, parachutes would open up, the capsule would slowly descend down, and just before it hit the ground, it was actually coming down on the parachutes a little too fast to land. So just before it touches down, there's some little rockets on the back end of it that fire to uh, slow down the descent just as they make contact with the ground. And then once they were on the ground, uh, they opened the capsule and brought the cosmonauts out, uh, and uh, they went through a recovery process. You know, one of the questions that we get asked a lot here at the Chabot Space and Science Center, uh, especially from kids, is whether or not Pluto is still a planet. Uh, as you probably know, back in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decided to declassify Pluto from a planet to what they call a dwarf planet. And that caused a lot of consternation and a lot of uh, debate about whether or not Pluto should be a planet. But one of the things we try to teach today is to not think of the solar system in the old terms. You know, back 200 years ago, the solar system was the sun and the planets, the eight planets or nine planets. Um, but today, with the new technology, we realize that there's a whole lot more out there than just a few planets. Um, so we're starting to kind of reclassify things. Rather than saying a planet is something separate from everything else, we divide the, the term planet into different categories. For example, terrestrial planets. Uh, the Earth is a terrestrial planet. Uh, the Mars and Venus and Mercury, those are all terrestrial planets. Then there are the giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then are, there's what we call the dwarf planets, like Pluto and Ceres and Eris and so forth. These are planets uh, that are smaller. They don't have enough mass to have completely cleared their orbits, but they're, they're still, they're round bodies and they look very much like a planet. Uh, and then there's another classification we call minor planets. And minor planets consist of all of the asteroids and comets that orbit around the sun. So today we see the solar system as much more complex than just the sun and eight planets or the sun and nine planets. We see it as the sun and millions of planets, terrestrial planets, giant planets,
dwarf planets and minor planets. The Chabot Space and Science Center is a nonprofit museum and science education center. Uh, we get most of our funding through donations. We also get funding from the city that we get a small portion of the city hotel tax. Um, but most of the funding, like I say, comes from uh, private donations. We also charge admission for the regular museum and uh, we do rentals and we have uh, programs for scouts and so on. So we charge for all that. But the majority of our uh, funding comes from donations. Um, the Chabot Space and Science Center is open from Wednesday until Sunday every week. Uh, so you can come up to the center and see all the exhibits. We have quite a few science exhibits here. Most of them uh, stress some aspect of space science. We also have a planetarium that you can go to. And uh, you can also come out, if you come up here on uh, the first Friday of each month, you can go and see all of that, plus come out to the telescopes. Uh, admission on first Friday is just $5. If you just want to come up and look through the telescopes, uh, we open the telescopes every Friday and Saturday night from 7.30 until 10.30 and just telescope viewing is free. So you come up to the back of the Chabot facility where the observatories are and you can come up and look through the telescopes and there's no charge for that.